So my name is Ryan Lambert. Um, from Fort Valentine, Montana, in the middle of absolutely nowhere, right? So, go ahead and get to the next slide. Uh, this, is, this is our farm. We do primarily, quote unquote, big A. Uh, we do wheat, peas, lentils, canola. Um, we farm about 20,000 acres. Um, this, my wife took this picture. These are our custom cutter combines. We have guys come in and help us cut. We run two new machines every year or two. Um, go ahead and go to the next one. This is Big Sky Country. This is why they call it Big Sky Country. Just beautiful, right? This is why I went uh, My background is, is I started in the Army Reserve just the way to pay for college. Um, got through about my sophomore year in college, got mobilized, spent about two years on that kid duty. And when they're talking about being successful, I guess one of the things I want to talk about being successful is how do you measure it, right? Like, how do you measure that success? Justin and I were talking about, like, like, when you're in Big A, and I'm speaking because I imagine not anybody would think that. That's some idea about Big A. Um, and I hate to say that, but it's, it's a different breed. It's a different way to say, how do we manage, how do we manage our success, and how do we deal with you know, what is success um, up to the point where I started farming, I met some success by how well I could do stuff, you know, being an honor grad in this, being, I got a degree in civil engineering, I was on, you know, honor rolls and, and everything else, so I could measure it really well, and I could measure it mostly through spreadsheets. Um, and so I tracked that and took that into my farming business as well. Um, and it leads really well into some farming things, but then you get yourself kind of pigeonholed into the spot where you can't really measure success anymore. And you have to measure it on different means. And that's the point where I'm at right now. It's like, how do we measure success in different avenues? Because right now, it's not. You're just uh, financially successful is a different route. Like, successful for me is just if I can go next year. Because it's really bad. It is really, really bad between all of the stuff that we've seen. You know, our markets collapse. Weather events, for us, it's all weather events in markets. That's what really controls whether I make it or not. Um, annual rainfall for me is not a inches. I've gone through a year where I've got one inch of rain. I've got years where I've got 49 inches of rain. So both sides, is, it's equally good. Um, and going back to Montana, so we are home of, uh, uh, the next one, Barn dances, this is my girls. This is actually a barn dance, like four miles from my house. We have barn dances. Go ahead to the next book. We go to a country school. This is kid, my picture of my kids at the country school. Also, that's a whole school. My kids are in the whole school. So, uh, we're home of the, go ahead to the next one, Big Buds. Yeah. So, if you ever get on YouTube and look, there's guys that are doing Big Buds. We have Big Buds. Um, that's my dad, um, Jerry. Um, he started farming in 1976. I came back in 2008, and uh, he definitely did everything to talk me out of it. But there I am. Um, and then we have, go ahead. We have really big, big buds. This is the 650 horsepower one. Um, we also have grass and track tractors and everything else. Um, but that's kind of the legacy of farming, right? It's big equipment. Get stuff done, vlog, hard um, Go ahead. I wanted to tell you if you could find the gold at the end of the rainbow, to <laughs> let me know, right? Because there's, it's super tough right now. It is super, super what? tough. Um, the one thing I'm trying to do is trying to, try to measure my success by different ways. Um, and I think that's a hard part. And I, it's so foreign to me to listen to in the other room the mental health side of, of agriculture and how that can help you know guys through their mental health and everything else because in my world i've struggled so hard because stuff just doesn't go right it hasn't gone right it hasn't gone right for several years two years ago i literally walked into my house and gave all of, all the firing pins and bolts out of the to my wife and said you better hold on to this it's like it's, it's not good you know, so suicide is not just a thing because you have other issues from a deployment or anything else. If you read any kind of articles in farming, that's why 
kind of foreign to me because farming, the suicide rate in farming is super high. This is not good. So we need to be able to measure our success some other way. What happened to me, go ahead to the next slide, is I have three, three kids. This is my son. This is him on the combine with me. He, when we go combining, he's in there in the morning, and he'll stay until grandma comes and drags him out. So how do I measure what success is? This is, the next one is, is a letter that my daughter wrote to me because up to about a year ago, I just worked. That's all I did. I just worked. There'd be days I never come home. I'd sleep in the tractor. I'd sleep in the service truck. Everything. I just would not come home because I was determined to be successful. And how is that view of success? You know, for me, it was always, am I going to pay my bills? How do I pay them? How do I bushel out? How do I get more acres? Um, and then what was life-changing to me is a year ago, my wife, we had a little baby girl, and uh, she had an amniotic fluid embolism, uh, died on the, on the delivery table. And so talk about changing your life perspective. This is... This is how I changed my life perspective. Go to the next one. This, this is my little girl Kennedy, and that's my wife and Kennedy together. And this year, Lindsay does the combine and the machine, so she gets the combine. But we've had all we ran all of our kids through combines. They've all been combine babies. <laughs> um, but that's what has changed my life. Um, you know, going from the point where you wonder what success looks like, and we talked about. You know, what success looks like, how, how do people view us as a success. And in the community, hey, now we're great success. People come up to me and say, how do you do this? How do you do that? What kind of chemicals do you do? What kind of do you do this? And I'm totally open to any of those, those kind of questions. What I can't answer is what makes you feel successful, right? I can't answer what makes you feel successful because that's up here, that's in your mind. And it's like going back to everything else that's going out there. It's so boring to me because agriculture is such a tough business, you know. In my business, it's so tough because you have to be able to measure success some other way right around, especially now. So I guess that's kind of where I'm at. Um, and I know that looking at, especially this peer group over here, of, of the other guys that are on the, the speaking panel with me, we all have the same problems, right? We all have the same problems with marketing. How do we, how do others perceive us as, you know, quote unquote, big age? How do we deal with it? Because we're farming massive amounts of big food. And I have conventional stuff, and I have organic. So I try to straddle that line. And the only reason why I have to do that is because I'm looking for a route to make money. You know, not because, you know, I super believe that the world is going to go down if I put fertilizer on it or if I raise it organic. I got organic ground that I just think, oh my gosh, you know, I'm ruining this ground. Organically, you're ruining this ground because you can't manage it correctly. And I have conventional stuff where people would come out and be like, you're you can't print something up. You know, so the, the perception is somebody else's perception. You know, for us, it's how we manage it best ourselves, how we try to do it, what we think is best. And I think that's one great thing about a farmer is that you can tell your own story. Um, Spence came to me and asked me, he's like, how, how do you combat, you know, the, the gentleman that was just speaking next door and said, well, we're trying to get out of the big A and trying to get it more local. That's great. There's a need for that. But there's also a need for me. There's also a need for me to be in the room, right? Because I'm feeding the world. You know, I might not be feeding the guy next to me. I might not be feeding anybody around me. There's nobody around me. If I raise tomatoes, I have to drive 130 miles to get to a town and those people in that town can't afford it because I'm rural. My reservation is poverty. They're not going to buy it from me. They're not commodities and food stores. So for me to say, I'm going to do that, it's, not, it's just not there. So I think there's a place for that. But there's also a place for us to say, this is what we're doing, and this is how we're going to be successful on it. You know, and it's just relative to where we are and how we look at our own. Um, Paul was talking about, we didn't know what we were going to talk about, and we were talking about 
how do we measure success and what do we do? And it's looking at all of our mistakes. You know, I, I guess the one thing that I'm sure he'll talk about is this, this we learn so much from that. We learn so much from our mistakes. My big mistake was just thinking I could work my way out of stuff and it don't work that way. You know, you really pigeonhole yourself into measuring something that you can't measure. Success that I have to come up here and you have to step back and say, hey, this is this is how I'm gonna measure success. This is how I'm measuring success now. I still have a really successful business. I'm actually paying my bank back this year, so I don't have to roll. Yay. 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 <laughs> so, I mean, Yay. yeah, so that's, that's, that's me in a nutshell, you know. I'm the only one who did a PowerPoint slide, guys. <laughs> but at least I got to show it because honestly, I didn't know, I didn't know what success means. I don't know, and it's so hard for me to get into because I don't know what success means. Everybody comes from a different background, but we all have the same problems, you know. And we're all looking through our own lens, and that's where the problems come from, is through our own lens. So, Tom, I'm going to let you take it from there. Thank you, Ryan. Right? Things and just 
tools. Now I'm out there and it's weird because I'll be out there in like November, you know, my hands and knees digging up soil and probably think I'm crazy, but you know, it's really like my earthworm. I don't know if we have, if we have dumb dudes out there moving stuff around. I don't know what the, the soil is doing. Uh, plus, if you have good soil health, the soil health is going to take care of your plants. Um, you know, and so for our inputs, we use cover crop mixes. We use a heavy cover crop mix, especially behind weeds, a 17 to 21, 21 way mix. We use buckwheat, turnips, radishes, dang grass, pearl millet, sun hemp, sunflowers, and the list goes on. Kale. So for ag or cattle farmers, this is what we really want to get into is rotational crop here. You know, because we're, for us, I don't know how much land goes out there for Montana, but we just had a little auction and it sold for $12,300 an acre. And we found 400 acres. <laughs> we can't jump in and start buying. But for us, we want to go for it. If we can take what we have, build our soil, and get the most money out of it, then that's, that's great. If we can go through, you know, our, or plant wheat, harvest our wheat, come through, have a nice head of cover crop on there, bring cattle in, start rotating them. Now we're not pulling hay off the field. We're getting an extra two months feeding. And with some of these cover crop mixes, some of the farmers in our area are seeing anywhere between three and four pounds average daily gain. Which is, which is huge on cattle. I think the average cow drops about like 35 pounds of manure. You know, so you're you're getting urea, you're getting manure, so you're down, you're getting your bio back into the soil, and then you move it. You just keep moving. And then you fall down with small rennets, bring your sheep on, bring your chickens on, and then it just helps the soil. You know, you're working in a symbolic relationship, which is amazing to see because Illinois we have great soil. And it wasn't because we had just rye grass and you know, something else growing. It's because Mother Nature worked together. You know, we had grazers coming through, meeting, you know, they were dropping them and they kept moving. You know, it's, it's, this isn't how it works. Um, and that's, that's what we're seeing. Um, I follow Jeff Moyer quite a bit at Rodell University. Um, he does a lot of no-till organic, which we can't really do yet. Um, but our wheat variety we grow is actually a following along this wheat line. So if we have rye and the rye gets away from us, we can't really control the, uh, the rye seed and the wheat is too similar, um, and we saw all the wheat ourselves. So, you know, it's, it's nice, we, we're getting anywhere between 1750 to 1950 bushel. Um, we grew blue corn this year, um, we grew blue corn last year, food grade, and uh, this year we get 1450 bushel for blue corn. Um, our soybeans we grew for seed beans, we're getting $28 a bushel for our, our seed beans. So for a small farm, we turned out profit, Especially we have cattle in here. We, we put down chicken manure um, on some of our acres. Uh, it depends on what we're going to do with it. But with chicken manure, your nitrogen level is about 32 pounds of nitrogen per ton. Um, we do use a lot of bed pack. Um, there's not high nitrogen content, but the organic matter that you get from your bed pack is amazing. Um, you put that on there and you're increasing it. Um, so it's really cool just to see the different dynamic that we're doing. And like I said, I mean, we figured out this last year in our organic transition. Um, I think the average farmers in our area are maybe making about 60 bucks an acre. Uh, even with our manure costs or labor costs, after our expenses, we were profiting 860 bucks an acre, um, which is a pretty good turn. Uh, we can throw cattle on there and other remnants, and we have a storefront. My wife and mother in law, they have flower shop, greenhouses, and they raise small produce. So we're loving that aspect. Now we can turn around and start perfectly integrating our farm. And we, have a we have a huge, huge, huge Amish population in our area. So uh, we kind of compete with them a little bit. We like have wheat, and corn, um, we get grist mill, so we're doing that kind of work. You know, we got flour we provide for the community, we got corn milk we can provide for the community. We can get steak, beef, meat, eggs, milk. We can have it all there in the local shop. Um, and it is a small community. Um, but you know, it's, it's nice to see that you can have a small farm that can be profitable, that you can't hang down from generation to generation. Uh, then, if you have a small community, um, I'm not knocking on big ag, but um, when big farmers come in and buy stuff from our small community, the money does not go back to schools. It does not go back to the resources in the community. And it, and it hurts, because you're losing people that have been a part of the community for years and years and years, and they're leaving. Shoot. People leave Illinois anyway because they be taxed really bad. <laughs> <laughs> really, really bad. Um, Shay, Shay can attest to that. So uh, I met Shay this year, actually. We bought some uh, beans off him. He did pretty well. Um, but yeah, so if anybody wants to see any pictures of what we're doing, 
See what we're doing. I have pictures on my phone. Uh, I'll be glad to show you guys. You guys can follow us on Facebook, uh, Twitter. No, not yeah, Twitter. And what's that other one? Instagram. We have Instagram stuff. Um, so we just got another 85 acres this year. We're transitioning to organic. Um, me and my follow up kind, of, kind of bumped heads on this because I just worked the ground with a high speed disc, uh, high residue, high speed disc. And uh, as I was planting our cover crop, I'm like, well. You know, we're just starting this. Like, this is starting from square one. This farm has been conventional for years. Um, so I had the soil probe, and I was out there doing soil tests. And apparently, he didn't want me doing soil tests at this time because he took my soil samples and threw them out. And then a month ago, he goes, we need to go out there and do soil tests on that field. Yeah, yeah, we do. They were already done, but he threw them away. So hopefully, he'll do it, but I doubt it. So he, had, he has leg amputated, so he's not getting around very well right now. <laughs> so, But uh, yeah, that's... Pretty much what we, we got going on. Um, oh, and marketing. So being organic, we, won't, we will not put a seed in the ground unless we already have a contract for it the following year. Um, everything we do is on a contract. Um, a couple years ago, we grew 100 acres of pumpkins for a cannery, which was actually pretty profitable. They, um, we just had to plant the seed. They came in, harvested it. The only issue we had with that is uh, we couldn't really keep our weed pressure down after pumpkins. And there's a lot of pests that came with them as well. But uh, like I said, going into a heavy cover crop mix, left it idle for almost a year. And uh, it turns out, well, our corn's doing good. And then uh, if anybody's ever thinking about transitioning into organic, don't just jump into it. Because if you are jumping into organics and you haven't done anything to start mending your soil, it's gonna hurt. You will have a big yield loss because you're putting chemicals on there, you have no microbiology, your macro and micronutrients are not gonna be there. Um, it, it will hurt you, but um, it, it can be profitable. And I mean, 20,000 acres, I, that's a lot of walking. <laughs> that's, that's a lot of walking to see what's going on in your field. So uh, yeah, I, I don't know how many acres you have organic, but my goodness, I can imagine. That's, that's a lot. Yeah, that's still a lot of walking. So, <laughs> drones. Do you do you guys use drones at all? Oh, man, I can imagine. So that's that's a lot of manure too. See, that's the hard part too. Is that uh, I'll, I'll let some other guys talk too. But for me, it's hard because again, it's it's rainfall dependent. Mm -hmm. Like I've had guys be like, "Well, you need to see cover crops and do this and do that," and I've seen it and if nothing comes up. Yeah. You know, there's no rain. We, we're borderline, we shouldn't be farming. Yeah. You know, See? I mean, that's the ground. Yeah. You know, and, and for us to say, you know, we're going to have cows come in and we're going to spray manure, there's, it's, I'm surrounded by grass. Yeah. It's, 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 tough. it's tough. Yeah. See, we, uh, so when we have a cover crop, uh, we go through with a flail mower right now because we don't have cattle. I'd love to have cattle going right now, but we're just not there yet. But we do have beehives um, with all of our different cover crops. We have awesome pollinators. So we figured we'd walk the fields. Like I said, we walk quite a bit. You go out there and you see monarchs and bees. We're like, well, why not put a beehives? You know, they're already out here. It's another vertical integration. And it works. It pays. You know, it's not labor intensive really for us. And the hives are around the field. So when you're going around the fields, just jump out and check your hives. It's, it's working for now. But then again, though, talk about markets. The tariffs don't affect us. 75% uh, of organic crops are actually imported to the U.S. Um, so there's a high demand that the U.S. market's not hitting. And, I mean, the profitability is there. So, you know, if you are a small farm, you know, look for that niche market to help you, you know, make a difference in what you're doing. Set yourself apart. There's people out there that's really interested in, in what's going on. Um, I'm going to say one more thing real quick, and I'm going to be done. But uh, I was out in California. Um, I went out there with Corteva. They had a little program out there. And there's a program called Ripe IO. Um, that they're doing in this Nugget grocery store. Um, they bring in a lot of local foods. And it's really cool to see what they're doing because um, consumers are really pushing this. But you can go into the grocery store and scan like a local product on your phone. And then it will come up, it'll show you, it'll give you a brief history about the farm, what the farm's doing, when the product was loaded onto the trucks, when the trucks got to the grocery store, and when they were put on the shelves. So the consumer can actually see every step of the way on what is going on. And, you know, that's... To me, that's a, that's a big part because 
we can do whatever we want to, but if the consumers aren't buying it, if they don't want that product, then there's not going to be demand for it. So, you know, education, I think, is a big aspect of what we're trying to do as well. So, that's it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Worthless trivia about your uh, uh, comment about the imported organics. I got a friend that does mar organic marketing, and he was sharing with me that last year they figured out that the country of Turkey imported more corn into the United States that was certified organic than the entire country of Turkey produced last year. Yeah, see, that, that irritates me, because Turkey, I don't, even know, I don't know what their standards are. I know that Europe, Europe has a lot higher standard than what we do when it comes to organics. Um, like so does so Canada. Does. No, but what was that? It was honey that they were mixing with, like, synthetic honey and yes. stuff, that's bringing from China. Like, yeah, so... Yes. Not even a product of their country, either. They're right. buying it. So you're buying it from certain buying it organic. Yeah. So here's a marketing scheme. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, it's. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Justin, you want to go next? You want me to Justin House, he was in the Air Force, fourth generation in Alabama, 1700 acres. Yes, yeah, so we, uh, we're a little under 2,000 acres of uh, peanuts, corn, cotton, and wheat when it doesn't rain on the I think that guy would like you to use this if you want to. Oh, okay. I, I was thinking I talk l awful loud. <laughs> that says mute. Test. All right. So we farm cotton corn, peanuts, and wheat occasionally. Um, we do nothing organic. Um, not knocking on it. It's just not a, there's not a lot of market for that in Alabama. And, um, you know, I have friends that tried it and, the fact of the matter is, a, a single mom in the poverty-stricken areas of South Alabama, they don't buy organic because they can't afford it. They're trying to put food on the table. Um, and you can buy a lot of peanut butter for what you can in an organic tomato. Um, but what we do, I'm with my, uh, my dad and my brother's here. We're, uh, he's going to retire soon and hopefully come back and join us. But um, we, we are trying to get our farm on a three-year rotation for, to do better for the soil, where we, we have um, a year of corn followed by a year of cotton and then a year of peanuts, because the peanuts is, are a legume, and they put nitrogen back in the soil. And we're in the same way with the cover crops. Uh, we try real hard to have at least a third of our operation in cover crops. And if you guys are interested in row cropping, one of the things that can help you get in, and, and I don't know about other states, but it's a federal NRCS program, is CSP. And, and in our area, it pays for a lot of cover crops. It's uh, the largest challenge to row cropping is the amount of money it takes to get in. It's, um, you know, I heard a guy one time call it your five minute millionaires. You're, you're, make all this money at the end of the year and you give it back to your bank, you hope you have enough to give it back everything you borrowed. Um, we work way more than the, I mean, the benefits are, are there because you work for yourself and, you know, you may find yourself on a rainy Tuesday and not have nothing to do and you're sitting at the house, but you don't get to schedule things on Memorial Day. You don't get to, to schedule the 4th of July. We're in the field. We're working. It's, um, sucks but then you know I finished harvest Saturday night um, and then got on a plane here Sunday morning and uh, I'm not really going to know what to do with myself when I get back I think I'm gonna <laughs> <laughs> sit around and do nothing for a few days <laughs> nah. but uh, you know to make an operation successful um, you got to have a super supportive family um, it isn't something I could do without my wife and, uh, you know, brother and in-laws and parents. And um, my, my fa I don't work for my father-in-law or with my father-in-law. He works for me every now and then. I, I hire him during harvest. And, and I am sure he's ready to be done with me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the feeling's mutual. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> He'd say the same. But, um, you know, row crops are the backbone of our country 
in agriculture. And I see these guys that say, you know, farming is um, helping them with stress levels and stuff, but I would say it's peaked mine since I've been in agriculture, and uh, I really need to get some beehives and uh, <laughs> do something else. But um, your benefits outweigh the cost, though. You, you work for yourself, and you will never do the same thing every day, and you'll never do it twice the same way. Um, if you base something off last year, it, it will not happen again the next year. Um, you know, and you, you're provided an opportunity to do good for your country and your community. Um, you know, and I, I would recommend and ask people to, to start being a part of your community. Be on your FSA boards. Um, interface with your legislature and push agriculture because the average age of the farmer is 60 something years old and it's um one percent of the people like they talked about feed the rest of the nation and that one percent is in their 60s so i don't think there's a better thing out there than to push veterans to get into agriculture whether it is growing specialty hogs for restaurants or growing peanuts um you know, I, I could get up here and speak to you guys but about growing peanuts, but that's kind of a niche market to our area, just like the guy growing hogs in Atlanta is a niche market to Atlanta. So you find what is good in your area and, and do the best you can at it. The satisfaction's there. Are you going to go home every day and feel like, man, I got that done? No, because you're probably going to be doing the same thing again tomorrow. And, um, you know, harvest is over, but we got to plant weed. It's always something new um, labor is our biggest issue um, I can't wait to try to get hooked up with some of these guys to where we can bring in veterans and you know I, I will find a trailer house somewhere to put somebody in if I can <laughs> I can bring somebody in and and you know help them help me um, it's, it, it wouldn't be just about helping them it'd, it'd help me because rural America is ravaged with um, you know, people leave um, or, or get on drugs or we have all kinds of issues. There's a reason my 65-year-old father-in-law helps me because I can't find anyone else. I mean, that's probably our largest challenge. And um, I think what, what Farmer Veteran Coalition is doing is, um, is a great thing, but, you know, approach your legislatures and your lawmakers and, and push this. Let's, let's make a move to where we, we have agriculture access to our veterans um, because no one else wants to do it apparently. It's, uh, you know, we need young people to provide the food for this country. I don't want to import corn from Turkey. Um, I want my corn from Illinois. <laughs> but anyway, thanks for having me. I, I, I have pictures. Um, I will answer any question you have. I'll give anybody my phone number. I love to have conversations about farming. Um, it's kind of hard to get up here and, and be specific to something because I don't know what you guys want out of the, the panel. If, if you want to know about our operation, how we got started, I'd love to uh, have a side note about that. I just joined our state chapter about 10 minutes ago. We, uh, we're getting together, so I'm excited about that. And, uh, thanks for the opportunity, guys. Thank you, Justin. So, Paul, yes, you're sir. last. I say Paul till last because he's my favorite. <laughs> yeah. He's my favorite because he served on the board of directors of Montana Farmers Union. So. Recent, recent graduate, I told Don. He just got off the board last month for uh, Montana Farmers Union. Yep, so uh, my name's Paul Canning. And uh, like Ryan, I'm from uh, God's Country up in Montana. Uh, very similar to Ryan in the type of farming operation with uh, conventional, uh, I don't have organic, um, no-till, dry land, uh, rotational crops, cereals and peas, lentils, canola, all the things that he was growing. I really enjoyed hearing Canaan say he can make uh, on some of his uh, $860 an acre profit margin. That's fantastic. If I want to make $860, I think I have to have 860 acres uh, with the way the profit margin is uh, up, in, up in my area. 
So I am on a, a family farm that I grew up on. Uh, had no desire or intention to be on that farm at this point in my life um, and when I was a kid. And so um, I decided that I needed to get off the joint and thought maybe college was a way to do that and couldn't afford it any other way. I certainly couldn't ask my parents to pay for it uh, in the 80s. Uh, things definitely weren't good. And so uh, Uncle Sam kind of hung a carrot out there and said, if you go to college, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll help pay your way through college and give you some opportunities later on. So I danced with the devil and ended up in the Air Force and uh, ended up doing 20 years and retiring in 2013. And about halfway through, uh, I was actually in Iraq and um, in, uh, in a combat support role for aircraft maintenance, trying to figure out what in the world am I going to do after this. Um, and at that, it was kind of actually a surreal, surreal moment. There was, uh, on the FOB there, we had some Australians. And there was one Australian who played the bagpipes. And um, it, it was one of the rare moments when there wasn't much going on in the, in the um, combat activities, and it was almost sunset, and this Australian dude is playing his bagpipes, and he's playing Amazing Grace, and I can't see him, but I, all I can do is hear it. And I, and I was sitting there thinking, what am I gonna, you know, what am I gonna do when I grow up? And decided then that I, that I wanted to get on the farm for a lot of reasons. Uh, and so I spent the second half of my career uh, working as hard as I could to get back to the place I fled from originally. Um, and so now we're farming. Uh, it wasn't a, necessarily a family transition. My father had passed away, neighbors were farming it, there was no farming equipment, so in some cases it was kind of a cold start, if you will, to get back into farming. Uh, but uh, now we're up there and, um, and we love it. We've made a lot of mistakes along the way. Uh, luckily, none of those mistakes have uh, run us off the farm, but there's always the, the potential for those. Uh, you know, <laughs> Ryan and I had a good discussion earlier about farm finances. So my specialty in aircraft maintenance was uh, stealth aircraft. That's what I did. And you think to yourself, how... how how can I take those skills? What did I learn on stealth platforms that apply to farming? Well, if you've seen my bank account, then uh, you know what stealth is like, right? Uh, <laughs> but the, the joy and enjoyment that I get from farming has to do with a lot more than the finances. And I'm really, really glad to hear Justin talk about uh, community involvement. I, in, uh, in an ultra rural area. Our greatest export is not wheat and it's not beef, it's talent. We grow outstanding young men and women and we send them off to colleges and universities and they move into some city somewhere and become great citizens. Those, that's our greatest export that we have. And if I can do anything to help turn that tide just a little bit for my little community, that's really what my passion is. And so I find opportunities to get involved in things like Montana Farmers Union, or even small things uh, like our, you know, our, our county cemetery board. It doesn't matter if it's big or small, there's leadership needed, there's leadership opportunities, and you as veterans have some outstanding leadership skills. And so I would encourage you to please, uh, please employ those skills because your neighbors and friends and family uh, need your talents, not just on the farm, but off the farm as well. So I, I won't go on long. Hopefully we can have a good discussion. This is a great group. Uh, um, Marvin doesn't know me, but I know Marvin. So I've met him on a trip to DC before. Uh, I, I feel guilty seeing you here. Um, he, this is Mr. Cattleman USA right here doing a fantastic job. I just signed a contract to grow uh, peas for Beyond Meat. So uh, 
<laughs> I was, I was kind of laughing about it on the way down here that I'm coming down here in the heart of cattle country and I'm, uh, I'm one of those guys providing alternative uh, protein. Uh, anyways, I, I hope we can have a good discussion here today. <laughs> uh, you know, share some lessons that we've learned. I've, I've learned a lot of lessons the hard way and I'm sure I will in the future. So thanks, Don, for the opportunity here today. I want to I want to capitalize on that 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 just that little bit of awkwardness, right? You know, I, I think the hard part for all of us is that whether it's or 100% organic or us that are raising conventional thing, I think the hard part is is that sometimes we can't put a face on, you know, what we're talking down about to. There's more than one way to skin a cat, right? Um, and we're all just trying to make it. Um, when I, I kind of get offended when people talk about, hey, this is big egg and you're big egg and this is, you know what big egg to me is? It's, it's my wife and me and my dad and the employees that I have. And yeah, I have employees. And so when we talk about big egg or we talk about if it's beyond, beyond beef or not, like I have the same thing. I'm like, man, if they just made some more of those burgers, I could get rid of the five bins of yellow peas that I have because I'm sitting on them and they're worth nothing. You know, and I also have a whole family that has 2,000 head of cow right next to me, and my cousin's screaming at me, oh, man, don't ever eat one of those. And I'm like, yeah, okay, well, whatever. You know, so it's hard to say what, I'm, what I want to say is let's think about it and, and try to say something not negative about anything in egg. You know, and I know that's tough. I know it's super tough. But I've done the same thing with people too, and I've learned it from my dad. And I don't, you don't realize you learn stuff until you're older, right? And I look at my dad, and we grew up in the middle of the reservation, and we've had tons of problems with alcohol, tons of problems with everything. I mean, poverty is where I live, you know, but I've never heard my dad say a bad word about anybody. In private, he tells me, hey, you gotta watch out for that guy or this guy. But in public, I've never heard him ever say anything negative about anything. And that's a hard part we in egg, I think, are coming to the cusp of, right? Because we're going to come to the cusp of whether I'm classified as big egg or this guy over here that's growing a hoop house, he's going to badmouth me and I'm going to say, try to defend myself. So I think that's going to be the real cusp of what our next play is going to be. And I think it's going to be tough. I think it's really going to be tough because there's only going to be one or two of me in the room. And there's going to be 50 people that are, are growing locally because I can't compete with the amount of people that are out there you know so I think you know as we go through this I think it's going to be super tough especially and I, I plead with those people that are that are growing we need a sales pitch yeah you need a sales pitch and you need to say this is where it's from and this is where I'm at this is how traceable it is I think all that stuff's important but what also is important is those of us that are still trying to make a living doing it conventional doing it the way we've done it and we, we, we need to not discredit that, you know, and I, I don't know if there's a silver lining in that or not, but that's the way the cookie crumbles. You know, if we all could do, you know, hoop houses and everything else, it, yeah, our problems might be solved, but we're not going to feed the world, you know. I mean, it, it definitely takes some massive equipment to raise wheat, you know, and I've looked at organic wheat and I've seen it run a quarter of what my conventional stuff does. And I've seen organic wheat sell for 22 bucks and now I can sell it for 10. So if you want to say that we can do this and it will make a good living, I think that's a farce as well because nobody can outproduce the American farmer. You know, and that's our detriment as well is that we can really produce. So I, I would just encourage those of you that are out there is if we have if you have a sales pitch that's great let's just not try to take it down on the side of somebody else whether they're certified organic or they're being able to trace it or not or whatever you need to watch your sales pitch that's that's kind of where I'm at and and it's tough because we do have that we do have that you're growing this and he's growing cattle but you you obviously know each other and you obviously have a great rapport for each other and that has no, that's the other thing that's great about egg is that I can go across the fence and I can ask my neighbor, 
how are you doing that? And I have no detriment on whether he's successful or I'm not. And so I just don't want to have, you know, I think we're really on the cusp of whether we start arguing with each other or not on what is good for the egg and what's not. So I just, I just want you to be cognizant that that's where, that's where I stand. It's, it's something that we all have to be aware of. I got three kids in school, yep. And there, there, how many are in the school? Three. So talk about this is the challenges of, quote, unquote, living in the middle of nowhere. Um, when we came back, uh, my kids, we drive 16 miles to a country school. Um, there's one teacher and my three kids. Um, I have a five AR, she just turned nine and 10 year old. And that's it, that, that's the whole school. So we have one teacher and so Paul was talking about we export our biggest thing is our children and I look at my children and think, I honestly think I don't want them to do what I'm doing. You know, I don't want them to follow my footsteps. It's just, it's too stressful. I can see the writing on the wall. It's not something that is, is, is gonna work out. You know, it might work out for one of them but I can't have four kids come back to the farm. So I'm trying to think of how can I raise a good export? How can I train a kid to be a doctor, a lawyer, anything to get him out of there? And, and, and that's the hard part. Yeah. Oh yeah, I, I think so too. I know Paul and I were just talking about it out there and I'll, I'll let Justin jump up. Um, it definitely has an issue, you know, for those that are just starting out like myself, I, I think I'm just starting out. I was the first one in our family to buy land. And so I have this high land cost of the 5,000 acres I own. So I have to lease another 15,000 acres because that lease is cheaper than what I owe. So I can cost average that land cost down you know if i if i didn't own as much and i think paul is kind of you know and we talked about it you know he he's in a different situation than i am he 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 but he still faces the same challenges of this has a cash flow or not it might just be a little bit different you know because his land cost isn't as much so yeah you can you can shrink down i think it is possible to shrink down but in the same breath you don't get those big windfalls either Right, you know, I've, I've cut and I've said, yeah, hey, I'm flush, like this year, I'm flush. You know, I've had a good crop and I'm flush and I can heal up. In the same breath, I've lost a lot too. So it, it, is, it, is, it is the scale and everything. I think that's it goes with anything, whether I heard, overheard some guy talking about feet of microgreens he was growing and I'm like, is that a lot? Is it like, is it like 500 feet of whatever? I'm like, is that a lot? I don't know, I don't know what a lot is. So to answer the same question in our area, um, we have a generational problem with people used to be attached to their land and were proud to own land. As that generation dies, their children are selling land as fast as they can. And it's putting a burden on us as a farmer because there's people willing to go in there and pay a high lease cost for just a few years and then dump it, or, or me as a farmer, I had to buy it. You know, there's land that we've been farming as a family for 30 years. Well, when grandma dies, it's for sale. And, and they, they have no loyalty whatsoever to the guy that's raised his family on that piece of property. So we are trying our best to get to a smaller farm with predominantly owned land. We can put irrigation on our own land because you don't want to put irrigation on somebody else's property and then grandma dies and they sell it. So yes, I, I think that our idea is to cut back, um, get a better rotation, and have, you know, 75% of our, our land owned and 25 leased where if somebody does come and undercut me, um, it doesn't kill my operation.
I'm not gonna stay on the sit though. The the, <laughs> the land that sold earlier I was talking about that sold for uh, twelve thousand three hundred dollars an acre was the average, but the land only appraised for nine seven. You know, so you have these other farmers coming in and buying it, that's way above land price value and you the, the smaller farmers we there's no way you can compete with that you know that's why we have to grow vertically you know we can't it's not feasible for us to go out and try to buy land uh, even even with the our profit margin it's it's not feasible um and like you said the labor you know there's two of us that that do the farm and there's after you plant you know after you're out there rotary hoeing and then you're, you're row cultivating and by the time that's done then your wheat's ready to be harvest you know if, if we can't find labor that we can rely on and that can take pride in what we're doing and what they're working on you know it's you just have somebody out there that's going to tear up your machinery or you're going to lose you're going to lose profitability because they don't care it's not theirs and they don't they don't have the passion for it um so that like you were saying earlier with with fec um, you know, working with land grant universities or other veterans that's coming in, either using their Montgomery GI Bill, their post 9/11, or vocational rehab. Um, you know, now they're transitioning 365 days out. I mean, if you can get the labor aspect, help them learn, get on a mentorship or educational farm, and now you don't have to cover the labor cost or the insurance cost because the military's still covering it. Um, you no, know, it's a win-win for everybody in this community. So, especially if we can get. Far, you know more people out there feeding the country and serve the country like you said it's you know i love farming because now we're going from serving our country to serving our community whether it's your local community or you know all over the u.s i mean we couldn't feed everybody in the u.s by what we're doing you know we, we need yeah. big farmers to to feed the world um you know, and, and ag can work for anybody. I mean, there's people, you know, that sell blueberries and that makes a living off blueberries and strawberries and small patches and large operations. It's, it takes the, it takes the community, it takes everybody. Um, and like I said, we're, we're all in it together. So I, I don't know, I just, I enjoy it. It's, it's something great. and somehow you're more profitable and, but I don't know if that's always true because you can get really really big and it doesn't seem like you define success differently you know it just gets outrageous so is there a sweet spot where you're like oh yeah at this level everything you know is, it's maybe counterintuitive you're at a lower production level but you're at lower overhead and your probably quality of life is probably the best at this spot even though it's only you know smaller or so medium or it's higher trying to find that spot so i i talk to farmers in our area because we do a little bit of seed sale also but um there's a farmer in my hometown they own about 800 acres they farm 1400 acres and he was talking about how he can become more profitable um so we were talking i asked him you know what was his game plan he goes well you know we didn't hardly make a profit this was two years ago he said we didn't hardly make a profit you know from last year's harvest I said, okay, so what, what are you wanting to do? He's like, well, we need to go out and buy more land. I said, that, make, that makes no sense to me. Why, if, if, you're not, if you don't have a profit margin now, why would you go out and buy more land? You know, find, um, you know, like I said, find the niche markets. I said, you guys can make more profit off of your land that you own if you start switching up your practices a little bit than going out and leasing or trying to buy more land because you're just going further in debt. If the profit margin's not there, don't, don't go further in. So then the guy talked to me about organics, and I told him he had to go out and walk his fields and check stuff. He's like, well, I don't want to do that. So, well, you're not going to succeed. <laughs> like, I hate to tell you that, but if you're not going to take the time and effort to work and go out there and see what's going on, you're, you're going to fail. I think even on the, I don't, when I came into farming, I came in to organic, so I don't know much about the conventional side. But, I mean, I'm sure the conventional farmers go out and walk their fields and see what you guys are doing as well. And you know, One thing, you know, so, so my background is like, so I went through school, got an engineering degree. I, I took what I did during school was I went and took some other classes. I took business finances and economic and analysis and stuff like that. So on paper, what you're trying to do is you're trying to maximize your fixed costs, right? You're trying to maximize your fixed costs. So if you have, like for example, me, I have two combines, two drills couple million dollars worth of equipment. I'm trying to do as most or as many acres as I can so I can cover that fixed cost over all my acres. 
if I only had a thousand acres and I had a five hundred thousand dollar combine or a million dollars worth of combines, which I have now, it don't work. Mm -hmm. It don't work. So the economy of scale is something that you have to look at and say, how do I do this? Am I gonna am I gonna be able to afford this tractor if I only have X amount of acres? Or if I and work or work backwards. If I have this amount of acres, what can I afford? So you really have to know your balance sheets and know how you're going to take that fixed cost, meaning you pay it whether you use it or not. What, what yeah. So when it comes into vineyards, you know, like wineries, I don't have a wine, yeah. I have a vineyard difference, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, when you get into wineries, people are doing that, you know, it's like bigger. You yeah. You big, huge, massive facilities and like all, your, your infrastructure and fixed costs go way up, yep. right? Like the yep. scale goes up. You got to have all this machinery, material handling, whatever. Is the law yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's totally, I mean, this, how do you say your name? Kanan. So, Kanan and I, you know, I mean, like, if there could be two different tales of the story, this is it. Yeah. Right? You like, you're talking about the old, like, late 1970s N5 cleaner. You know what I mean? Like, yep. just Russell's in the floorboard. Yep. Because and we don't, it runs when it, the grain comes through, it's really clean. We've rebuilt the, you know, the hopper, or not the hopper. But, um, oh my gosh, I'm blank now. The cages and everything in it, like, yeah, the green's really clean. And it runs well, for the most part. It leaks a little bit every now and then. But um, and that, it works for us. And this hits exactly on what I, I, I was trying to explain in the beginning, is that success is what you're seeing through your own glasses. You know, success really is what you see through your own glasses. Whether you think success is getting to that point where you have a, a winery and you're doing whatever, I don't know what wineries do, 100 bottles a year, if that's success, that's success. Or if you're saying I got 10,000 acres of vineyard and you know I got trees in the ground that are gonna be ready in 10 years, if that's success, that's success to you. And you have to be able to say, this is where I'm at. You know, and, and in the same breath, try not to take down at somebody else's success. Because I don't wanna talk to Canaan and say, well, you're not successful because you don't have 10,000 acres. You know, I don't want to tell him that. I want to tell him it's amazing what he can do on that. You know, and I, and what's amazing to me is I went fishing four times this year. I didn't, I haven't been fishing four times in the last 10 years. And I didn't catch a thing except for I caught my dog once when I went to go throw the lure. That was success for me right now. So, Looking at that, you know, there is economic ways that you can say, yeah, I can, and I can show you that, you know, this is where you're at. This is your fixed cost. This is your marginal cost. This is where you need to be, where they peak and they cross. That's where you need to be. That's how you maximize your profits is right there. That's all economical. But what's not economical is in your brain and what you view as success, whether it's your calling to say, hey, I don't want to use chemicals because of this is my viewpoint, or I don't think people should even eat cows. And this is my viewpoint. So that it it really is through the lens of your own success, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Real quick, I appreciate the question. I think that's a great question. Um, so, like I may have explained, I'm a little bit of a knucklehead, and uh, I'm kind of a ready, fire, aim kind of person. And so I'd been farming for three years, and uh, and had an opportunity to pick up. A bunch of land. The guy said, "You want to farm all this land?" And, and the natural reaction is, "Yes, I'll add more." Uh, but there was no strategy or planning or foresight into that. And so, if it were to happen again today, my answer would be different, uh, because <clears throat> the the right size is different for everybody. I was telling Ryan earlier. Uh, I'm somewhere in between. I farm about 5,000 acres. In my part of the world, that's somewhere between, for me, between hobby and business. And I kind of want to keep it there. Um, I, we don't need employees full time. We don't have an H2A trainees coming in like some other operations do. And I like that. That works for us. Um, and so I. I Obviously, the answer is different for everybody. Uh, the only thing I guess I would encourage people is have a strategy or a reason or a business plan. It, 
to tell you whether to expand or not. I didn't. I just took it on. It's working now, but my answer would have been different in the, uh, now than in the past. And part of that's because I have a military retirement, so we have the we have the freedom of knowing there's always grocery money, right? Uh, I'm not taking we're not taking an owner's withdrawal like a lot of people, you know, need to in order to buy new shoes and diapers and all the other things. So. What's the next question, Don? It's scary. It does not. <laughs> I shouldn't have brought that awkward, awkward, shouldn't have brought that up. Uh, so my question for everybody in here is, uh, I'm, I'm kind of curious, because I've screwed this up in the past and I probably will in the future. I would like to hear from some growers how they um, build their relationship with their banker and how they uh, determine what the right fit is, what type of uh, uh, capital assistance that they need, how do they figure out what the right banking avenue is, and how do they maintain that relationship? Start with me, huh? Yeah. Uh, man, so my banker um, was a friend of a friend who said, hey, this guy's in ag lending. When I went back, I started with FSA um, and then got, you mean turn around? Sorry. Um, so I started with FSA and at the time you could take $300,000. Well, that's not enough to cash flow our operations. So I made deals with chemical companies and anybody that would give me high interest on something I needed. Um, and fortunately, my first year, we made a lot of money. Um, we, we had a really good year. And I stayed with FSA one more year. And then um, it was May, and I didn't have any money yet. Um, I understand there's a lot of efforts being made to make FSA a little, little easier for veterans to get money from. But um, they delayed me about three months, and I was, I was about to miss some lease land rent payments because of them. So I had to go to a banker and the guy said, hey, a friend, a friend of mine is a banker and put down and go through what I had. And uh, he said, well, we're going to finance you. And I got lucky. I like the guy. Um, he's a little hard on me every now and then, but I mean, I don't blame him. Um, but I started with FSA and I think it's a good place to start, but it's, uh, our local office is not very good. I, I wouldn't, I'd give them a one out of five stars if I had to. But I, I think there's some good programs out there, um, and and it's a good start. Um, but if I'd had a bad year that first year, man, they ate me up on interest on some of the deals I struck to to buy fertilize and and seed. And uh, but it's an important relationship. Um, 
he's got to, uh, or he or she's got to uh, be on your team while holding you back at the same time. Um, one of our biggest side glenders in our area is a, is a female, and uh, she does really well at it because she's not afraid to tell everybody that no, <laughs> you can't do that. <laughs> but uh, so yeah, that's kind of my answer to that. So, and then I'll be quick. Um, one of my largest gripes with the farm bill is we pay billions to crop insurance companies, the subsidized crop insurance for row crop farmers. Um, that money should go to the farmers, and then they should make that choice whether to buy crop insurance or not. Um, I don't get that subsidy unless I buy crop insurance, and that's a whole other story. But yes, we have to have it. If we don't have it, we, we it, we'd be done after one one bad year. You know, I live in hurricane country, so without it, it, it could. Yeah. yeah. And same answer. It's not an option. My experience with the lending side is just based on crop insurance. You know, like when you go into a situation and you don't have a way to capitalize your your deal um, you can't make it so you have to be able to say here's my crop insurance this is right up front like this is where it's going at um, Kanan said he's he doesn't grow anything without a contract that's relative to what he's doing and I, I he probably has crop insurance too but that's a way of his insurance is to say here's my contract I'm putting it around we grow everything without a contract. The only way we sign a contract is if we're buying on the board or we're selling out in front of us. Even our organic stuff is 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 not fully contracted. I have an act of God for the first ten bushels, and then after that, it's on me. You know, so it, it's you have to have that insurance so you can take it in. One thing I would suggest, like like with you with the vineyard, um, there's policies out there that you can look at, like whole farm policies that take your all of your income and say they take a five-year average on your income. So this is the hard part with anything in ag is that it's kind of built in to not really beginning farmers. But if you have five years of history, you can go in and you can put in whole farm revenue protection, which takes your benchmark over the last five years of what you've had, and it will ensure that. So if you have a dip in the market or you have a freeze or whatever, the market goes to crap, you can capitalize on that and, and, and capture that revenue because historically that has been your five-year average. Where it eats you alive is when that's a slow march down. And that's what happened in, that's what happened in to us in row crops is that it's been a slow march down. Not just I don't run whole farm, but I run revenue protection. And it's been just a slow march down. So instead of me being guaranteed a revenue of 250 bucks a year, now it's 225. Now it's this, and now it's 100, and now it's now now to the point where I'm kind of wondering, do I self-insure because this isn't even worth insuring? Because yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're just like this is ridiculous. But going to the banker side of it, that's the first thing you need to know. And in any egg, that's the first thing you need to know is where you, where your bottom line is if all hell breaks loose, where that is at. Um, what happened to me is I. I had a banker and, and they worked with me and, and they didn't pull the reins back on me and they didn't communicate efficiently enough with me until they got to the point where they had internal problems at their bank. A woman schemed, what, million, million five right off their ledgers. And I'm like, is this gonna have any influence? Oh no, you're good, you're good. I go in, we're working on a note. I'm like, I need to buy a new sprayer. It's been in my business plan. Yep, you're good. I go buy a $350,000 sprayer. I'm waiting to go seed in March. I'm going to seed in two weeks. I go in the bank's like, we're not going to do this. You're too high risk. We, you need to do something else. You need to go in and you need to either go talk to the FSA or do this. Thank God I had uh, farm credit 
because Farm Credit helped me buy a farm. And I went into their office and threw all my stuff on the desk and said, here it is. Either I'm two weeks away, I've already bought stuff. Either you finance me or you buy my farm from me right now that I, you have a note on, because that's options. And I have really good books, and it took her about two weeks, and they still had to chase through, and we buried some money at the FSA and refinanced that and went through, and we were going again. You know, but if you don't have a good banker, it's ugly. Yeah, especially if you want to do anything else size-wise. But, yeah, go through and find insurance, whether you, it's having a contract up front or, or you can have whole farm. Yeah, here's the, here's the deal is that we have to deal not just with that. So I got five different moving windows. Fuel's one thing. You asked how much insurance costs. Insurance costs one thing. Fuel's, you know, on, on my organic side, fuel's a huge, huge thing. You know, I don't know how much fuel we run through. We have a tanker come about every week, you know, and we're getting 6,000 gallons dropped all the time. So fuel's a big thing. So I try to hedge that on the board, you know, and I try to hedge my futures on the board. So there's only so much you can do, and it's just your mindset, right? Like, and it's totally how much you are aware of your risk and what you're doing because you can't you can't be two years out in the future because you don't know like i said even the organic side i saw wheat 21 bucks a bushel for organic and now i can sell it for 10. two years ago you could you guy had guys walking away from contracts at 19. they do anything for 19 now so it's tough to say that far out you know and there's two ways of thinking my mom one time this is justin might find this amusing my mom come to me one day she's has five jars of peanut butter and my wife's like why do you have five jars of peanut butter bonnie she's like i heard there's a hurricane coming through and took out all the peanut crop down there <laughs> and she's like it's gonna make the cost of peanut butter go crazy i was like you know what when we get hailed out i said the price of bread doesn't move I said, and when those guys lose their price of peanuts, I said, the farmer's taking a hit. It's not the peanut butter guy, you know, and that's what happens. So it's either you buy in bulk. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So we stocked up. We're just kind of, I think she's just end up working through all the peanut butter. <laughs> yeah. So.
to help them do business with, with the corporations, right? So really in the last five years, there's been a, a movement to try and do business with more veteran-owned businesses. And most veterans know the VA CVE process, right, um, to get to do business with the VA. But in corporations, they want to do business with farmers, but they, you know, you always hear we can't find them, right? So one of the tools um, which I'm excited about is this coalition, right? So now we know there's veteran farmers and different capacities, right? And we talked about not everybody wants to do business in federal or corporate or state and local. Maybe it's a, a lifestyle farm, and that's fine too. But for the big ones, the scalable ones like Kellogg's, you know, the ones that are trying to find the veteran-owned farmers, they want a source. But, but they can't find them. So we're going to start working with Michael about how do we connect you to those procurement opportunities. We just had a big procurement summit in Columbus, and there was a, a corporation that was looking to source organics, right? So again, it's not a promise, and everything, nothing's easy. But one of the tools is to get certified as a veteran-owned business, which is, you know, sorry, but more death by paperwork, you know. But it's to show that you own, operate, and control your business, right? And an application fee, and then, and then you go through, and that way they can source from you, right? So one of the things we're working on with Brian, is, or uh, uh, Marvin, um, is so we're going to sit down with Denny's, right? He's going to bring Chick-fil-A and Compass Foods, the distributor, to say, how can we do a carve-out and try maybe do some business with you, right? Because they're all franchises, but they all buy from the corporation, right? So they make that sourcing selection. So uh, I have some business cards that we can talk later. But again, it, it's a tool, right? It's a tool. It's not a promise of business. It's like a hunting license. But at least it's another way to look at procurement opportunities, right? So. So I've been approached by a couple of different uh, entities to to be a supplier and one of the difficulties I think we have <laughs> one, of, one of the difficulties that I've had a question answering and maybe somebody can coach me up here a, a lot of times the people that are looking for product they want a stable guaranteed su supplier and I can't do that all the time right because it's whatever the good Lord gives me that year. In some years, it's, it's a lot, and sometimes it's not enough. And that is a difficult thing uh, when you're signing on to be a supplier to somebody to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to provide you whatever metric tons of whatever product, because I don't know if I'll have it. So maybe somebody can coach me up on that. The flip side, too, is I've had it where they're like, well, I need this, and I'm like, that's not even worth me chasing after but if there I am totally and that's why I get totally not jealous but it's just a different mindset when I meet people like Kanan that are like well we're gonna go vertical you know and I know that yeah I put all my time into you know quote unquote my work but he's gonna put all kinds of time and effort into that work of finding the finding where that's gonna be at where that dealers gonna be at where everything at my thing is is if yeah if if you could find that I'd be willing to pay for that, you know, and that's the thing is that we don't have, I personally don't have time for that, you know, because it's so, it's just, it's time consuming and it's super, you know, in our, in our experience, it's, it's risky, you know, but if, oh, yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. It, Oh, yeah. That it's, uh, but that business development is what we can help you do to connect with those corporations that really want to source from you. Yeah, and, and that's totally, I mean, like, uh, you're on to something there because there's so many guys that are in my boat that would love to have that opportunity. That's why I went organic was because I wanted to be able to say, here's a product that is deliverable to somebody in the States, right. you know, because that's where the money's at. You know, those of us that are putting our product on the rail and going, yeah, we're feeding the country, but we know that we're not getting the premium for that. Because you look at this wheat that's organic, and somebody's willing to pay with that, that's because they have the money. We have the money here in the States. Globally, no.
but in the states but if we could find that point of contact and it's all about the story that's why i encourage again is is to not hurt somebody else's story you can have your own story but let's not hurt somebody else's story let's have the story where it's like hey yeah this was raised by a veteran it might be conventional and it might be whatever but this was raised by a veteran that's a good story and people will be able to market that and sell that and not necessarily take somebody else's share because that might just add 10 cents to it rather than five dollars and it's full-blown organic certified so oh yeah she would have been yeah yeah You know, and, and there's a lot of guys out there that are in my same boat that it would be really helpful to because they just can't put the time into it. Yeah, yeah. hundred million dollars for the unsourced requirements. And it was funny because NBBDC is headquartered out of Detroit. Well, that's automotive. So I'm part of the North Carolina Veterans Business Association, and we have a procurement summit. So when they came and sponsored our event, we had veteran farmers there, right? We connected them local because they were small. The caterers, they're like, oh my gosh. Kellogg's, everybody's trying to find these veteran farmers. Where are they? And I was like, that's our number one industry, right? But who knew, right? So it is that shifting conversation. You know, you get certified and you get into that that supply chain. Yep. It's a great opportunity. Yep, I, yeah, I yeah. I think I'm done. I'm, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's actually worked out well. It's 1157. So thank you, guys.